All right, good morning to those that are here at Faith Family Chapel and to those that are joining us online. We are here on Sundays at 10 a.m. Uh, we are in the book of Romans. We will be picking up Romans 9 this week. We're going to open with this scripture from Romans 9.15. It says, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. This is God speaking. And this is kind of this whole, this whole ideology that we talked about uh, in chapter 8, that God has you know, sovereign power, but you as an individual still have um, your own personal choice, your own personal freedom. You get to pick and choose. God is not looking for robots. He's looking for those that will love him back. And so they're going to start this conversation because as we finish in 8, Paul is talking, he says, uh, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor death or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Nothing can separate you, Christian, from the love of God. And we talked about except for you. You can choose not to love God back. You can choose not to, right? So, but God's going to love all of his creation. So why do bad things happen? Why do certain things happen? Doesn't he love them too? Doesn't he love that situation as well? And the answer is yes, he loves everyone, but everyone gets to make a choice. The six-year-old that made the choice to go into school with a gun and shoot his teacher he made a choice. The people that were, you know, the cops that were beating on that poor uh, individual that was on the news recently, they made a choice. Putin, who's invading Ukraine, makes a choice. It's not that God doesn't love the Ukrainian people, but the Russians made a choice. We make a choice every day. You make a choice. I heard it on a, one of the shows that I, I tend to watch, and the, the young man was, two young men were speaking, and the young man said, every choice you make has an effect on someone else, even if you can't see it. Why don't you act like you know that? What a sobering response. Everything we do has consequences, either positive or negative. But what Paul is saying is, but just because of you doesn't stop God from loving you. God loves you unconditionally. But that doesn't mean there aren't consequences. It doesn't mean there's no consequences. And so he's going to continue. And this is going to be a little troubling for the uh, Jewish brethren that are in Rome because he's already, he's already kind of started out saying, you know, that the law was good, but the law led to death. And the only way you can get to salvation is through Jesus Christ. And he's kind of answering a question that he knows is going to come up with his Jewish brethren, that they're going to be like, whoa, 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 then God lied to us because he told us that we just followed the law, we get to go to heaven. What are you talking about, Paul? Did God lie up front? Did he, did he lie that, you know, we couldn't get to heaven? And so he's going to try to address this uh, conversation and prove that, no, God never lies. God never lies. The law was good. The law was true. If you could obey the law, you get to go to heaven. But the reality is he wants to continue bringing it around. You can't obey the law on your own. You don't have the capability as a human being. You're flawed. You're flawed. Well, did God make flawed people? No. God gave you free will. You flawed yourself. You get the idea? We create our own mess. It's, it's, I mean, not for you, nothing, but I, I, you know, my lifestyle, when I've been in a mess, I'm always the culprit. <laughs> it's been, I mean, I don't think I can remember a lot of times where it wasn't me at all involved in the mess, right? I, I did something to get myself in this mess. So we're the problem. But Paul wants to continue on because he wants to make sure that the Jewish nation knows 
God still loves them. The promises of God are true. Everything he promised them was true, but because of their failure to be able to obey, he gave them a secondary um, he gave them a secondary out, which was the salvation of Christ. Verse 1 of, of chapter 9. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. So again, we, we've kind of seen Paul do this throughout his letters to the churches where he has to remind them, super apostle, I'm the guy. I'm the one Jesus sent to me, to you. I, I'm not lying to you. I, I'm telling you the truth. And the Holy Spirit, who I have possession of, is validating that. Something like, if I'm lying to you, I, I got to think like the Holy Spirit would do something to, right? And it could. Why? Could, why not? It's it's purely possible, right? But he keeps telling them, "I'm not lying." And we found that in Acts nine. Go said the Lord, "This man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and the and before the people of Israel." Which is why we're focusing on the letters of Paul. He's talking. Jesus is talking about Paul here. Paul writes letters to the church. He establishes the church. Everything that Paul says applies to us as the church. We should be paying attention. Amen? And so that's why we've been focusing on it, and we'll continue until we get through all the letters of Paul. Verse 2, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I, I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. He's He's writing to them. He knows that everything that he's saying in regards to, hey, the law leads to death, and you need to focus on Christ, he knows this is causing them problem, and they're refusing to accept Jesus. Remember, they crucified Jesus. The Jewish nation, the chosen people, crucified him unjustly. And Paul is saying, I wish, I wish that I could suffer instead of you, as in, if you don't get this, you're going to suffer. And, and, and I think in our, in our modern, modern culture right now, you know, you as a Christian, that's your, you know, your responsibility to suffer emotionally in anguish for those that are going to perish. Everyone around you that is not a Christian is going to perish. How do you respond to that? Do you really have that emotional connection that you understand they're going to perish? Do you feel that love for one another in such a way that you feel the pain that you know they're going to experience even though they don't understand it? Yeah, I struggle with that. I kind of look out. I, I, I look out for me first. I'm like, I'm okay. You're in trouble. Oh, well, your problem. That's not Paul here. That's how he could respond, but he doesn't. He's like trying to get them to understand, look, I wish I could take your place, but I can't take your place. You're going to suffer this. It's the same thing that Moses was doing with God when uh, he was up on the mountain getting the law, and they were down below making a calf of gold to worship it. And God's like, I'm going to deal with this. We hear in Exodus 32, so Moses returned to the Lord and said, oh, what a great sin these people have committed. They have made gods of gold for themselves. Yet now, if you would only forgive their sin, but if not, please blot me out of the book that you have written. Like, if you can't forgive them, then don't, don't let me survive either. You know, he's bartering with God. That's how much an evangelist loves the people around them. That's hard. That's a depth of love. You've got to search your heart. Do you have that depth of love for those that are perishing? Or do you only love those you, that love you back? Right? We've got that discussion with Jesus. It's easy to love those that love you back. It's hard to love those that don't love you. I mean, I struggle easily. <laughs> you know, those that are in my circle of, of love, yeah, I hurt when you hurt. Those are outside my circle of love. I'm like, eh on you. But that's not how we make an effect in the church. Where is our, you know, where's the depth of our caring for those around us that are not Christian, that are going to perish, that are hearing the message and acting just like the Jewish brethren that Paul's talking about? And they're like, yeah, no, I'm not accepting that. He continues, and he's talking about the Jewish nation specifically. He's like, theirs is the adoption to sonship. There's the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. He's like, you were given everything glorious by God. You were the chosen. You had all 
of the pieces that should point you at how honoring and wonderful and truthful God is. Deuteronomy 7, 6 says, For you are the people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his prized possession out of all peoples on the face of the earth. He's talking about Israel. It's not applying to us, the pagan. We're just lucky we got in. But he chose them specifically as a people. And Paul's like, why are you not paying attention? God chose you specifically. He gave you all of these wondrous things to prove to you that he is God and you are his people. But you're not paying attention. He continues. There's the patriarchs. And from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, who is God over all forever praised. So he, he's going through, he's like, God gave you everything. You enjoyed everything as the chosen nation. But you rebelled against God over and over and over and over. You had it all. And he goes so far to, to remind them that you were the... Your ancestry brought the Messiah. You can find that in Matthew 1. It's the genealogy of Christ. And it starts off, it says, you know, Jesus the, Messiah, uh, uh, Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham, Abram the father of Isaac, on and on and on and on until you get to Mary, the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. The lineage, all the way through. So how did you miss Jesus? You had all the judges, all the patriarchs, all the kings, all the glory, all the but you missed Jesus. And so he's, he's trying to, you know, encourage them. You're missing the point. This has nothing to do with God. It's like the story about the guy that there's a flood and he's praying to God. Yeah, God's going to save me. The first guy can buy in a boat. Yep, God, I'm waiting. God's going to take care of me. And he goes up to the second floor. It's flooded. I'm waiting. God's going to take care of me. He's finally on the top of the roof. They come by one last attempt. I'm waiting. God's going to get take care of me. And then basically, he's gone. They didn't, they're waiting on something, even though God kept sending them example, evidence, over and over. It's one of the things, if you, I mean, there's a lot of news in the, in, in, in the uh, world today about new archaeological digs and new findings and new and new uh, stories and new um, <coughs> books written in early times about this Jesus and Moses and on and on, and they don't jive with the Bible. They don't jive with the Bible. Uh, the one I, I, I came across was the history of creation according to a Japanese guy. <coughs> and he went through all of this stuff. The problem is it doesn't jive with the Bible. And the Bible jives with history over and over and over. Lately, they've been finding all kinds of archaeological digs that lead to, oh yeah, there was a King David. Oh yeah, there was this place. They're going to open up Solomon's pool or, or whatever it is where you know Jesus met the leper and they wanted to get in the pool. That's been found and going to be reopened. All of these things are evidence that the Bible is true and accurate. None of the other religions have this. None of them have that that they can point to. It's conjecture. We don't have conjecture. And so that's, and that's what you know, Paul's saying to his brethren. He's like, listen, you've got all of this evidence, but still, you missed Jesus. So he goes on, he says, it's not as though God's word had failed, for not all who dis are descended from Israel are Israel. This gets interesting. Not all who are descended from Israel are Israel, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. So he's now bringing evidence based on some specific uh, points in time where the lineage of God is basically broken off into trees. And we're going to cover the first one. It's Ishmael and um, Isaac and Ishmael. Okay. But I'm going to start with not all who are descended from Israel, Israel, which means, wait, Aren't you Jewish if you're born Jewish? That's kind of the, that's kind of the method. You're Jewish, so you're automatically, if you're born in a Jewish household, you are Jewish. And, and so we covered this already in Romans 2, 28. A man is not a Jew because he's one outwardly, nor is circumcision only outward and physical. Meaning, if it's not a circumcision of the heart, if it's not what you are inside, it doesn't matter whether you were born a Jew. If you don't act like a Jew, you're not a Jew. 
right? You're not, let's flip it to Christians. You don't act like a Christian, you're not a Christian. Outwardly, yeah, you go to church, you jumped in the water, you got baptized, but inwardly, if you're not a Christian, you're not a Christian. Get the idea? It's the same idea he's talking to, but he's really pointing at the Jewish nation. But let's pick up this, this Isaac and Ishmael. So God had promised Abraham, basically, a child. God, uh, Abraham was very, very old. His wife, Sarah, or Sarai, was very, very old. And God had come to him and said, hey, I'm going to make you the father of all nations. He just got a promise, you know, promise, uh, I, I promise to you that that will happen. We find that in Genesis 21, 12. But God said to Abraham, do not be distressed about the boy and your maidservant. Listen to everything that Sarah tells you, for through Isaac, your offspring will be reckoned. Well, who's this boy? Well, the boy is, they're going along, they're old, and Sarah says, hey, maybe God meant that you should have this, you know, that you should have a child with our maidservant. I can't give you a child. Maybe what he meant was you should have it somewhere else. So why don't you sleep with the maidservant? Okay. <laughs> and off he goes, and they have a child. And God's like, that's not the promised child. Wait for the promised child. That is not the one. Oops. Sorry. And, and so he's going to have this discussion now regarding um, whether or not, you know, how man gets in the way. This, this thing called the flesh versus the spirit. Things we do in the flesh versus things we do in the spirit. He continues with verse 8. In other words, it's not the children by physical descent who are God's children, but it's the children of the promise who are guarded as Abraham's offspring. For this is how the promise was stated. At the appointed time, I will return, and Sarah will have a son. That's a critical message there. <laughs> At the appointed time, I will return, and Sarah will have a son. The promises of God come at the appointed time. God's time, not our time. God's time. Well, if God knew that, that the fall of, of Adam and Eve in the garden were going to cause man to be cursed with sin of death, why didn't he bring Jesus like the next year? <laughs> why did he wait thousands and thousands of years to bring in Jesus to be the salvation of the world? It's the appointed time. Why hasn't Jesus already come back and, and, and made his second coming? Because it's not the appointed time. God has an appointed time for everything that he does. I think about it in regards to um, you when you make decisions. Well, I want a new job or I want to move to a new place, or I want to date a new person, or I want to do this, or I want to do that. Do you actually go to God and wait on him? Or are you like, oh, I went to him, but I didn't hear anything. So I assume that's what it should be. We need to wait on the appointed time. By waiting on God's appointed time as his children, things work out. When we do it in our physical need, I want it, I need it, I got to do it, they don't work out so well. Yeah, it might have some success, but it's not the kind of success that God provides. You know what I'm saying? The appointed time. All right, let's get back to the uh, uh, offspring of Abraham. Ver uh, Galatians 4 says in 22, for it was written that Abraham had two sons, one of them by the slave woman, Hagar, we talked about that, and the other one by the free woman, his wife. Hagar, slave, his wife is free. So Paul's kind of making a, a, a description here. They did something with the slave woman, so flesh, under burden, and God's going to do something through the free woman, spiritual, free. Okay, One's going to work out really well, and the other not so much. His son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh. Sarah and, and uh, um, Abraham got together. They made a plan. They 
enacted the plan, and they ended up with a child. But his son by the free woman was born through the promise. So the warning that we have here is when your flesh is desiring something, you need to go to God first. You need to go to God first and check with God and wait on God. Well, how else can I do that? You can go to the Word of God. That's the simplest. I would like to do this. Well, let me read the Word of God, and what does it say? There's an awful lot of answers there. Well, what do you mean? Well, if you, uh, I want to move away and go do this. What does the Bible say? Does it bring you closer to God or further from God? Well, it brings me further away from God. Then you shouldn't move. Yeah, but I will have a beautiful house, and I'll have this, and I'll have... It doesn't matter. It takes you away from God. Well, I want to have a relationship with that young person, that man, that woman. Is that young man or woman uh, uh, Christian? Well, no. Well, then, no. You can't have a relationship with that person because the Word of God says, don't be yoked with an unbeliever. Yeah, but I really like them. They're so nice, and they treat me so well, and they have a great you know, uh, job, and they're financially... St- it doesn't matter. What does God say? You get the idea? There are a million things you could go through. Well, if you wanted to actually search the Word of God, you could have a conversation with another Christian. What do you think about this? Well... This is what we think. You can pray on it. But how many times do we as Christian individuals really do that, honestly? I'm a really independent guy. I feel I'm a really bright guy. I can accomplish a lot of things pretty much just on my own is what I think. And so I operate like that a lot without going to God. The whole point of Galatians is... Something is done according to the flesh, and then something is done according to the promise. Uh, Romans 8 will, tells us in verse 14, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. It's not the physical aspect. It's not because you jumped in the water, you show up at church, and you say, I'm a Christian. Everyone calls themselves a Christian, but how do they act? That's the critical nature. Jesus, if you obey me, you love me. I will love you and my Father will love you. I mean, it's, it's not about if you go to church, I love you. That's not it. So what happens? We get uh, Ishmael who shows up. Ishmael, after the fact, the, the, the child born of the flesh, Genesis 16 says he'll be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him, and he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. Most theologians believe that Ishmael was basically a founding father of the current uh, Islamic and Arabic condition. They've been living out there fighting against each other for eons, eons, over and over, because Abraham and Sarah didn't wait on God They brought in one of the largest enemies of Christianity, right? Islamic uh, religion is not in line with the Christian religion. It's just not. It's combative. That came into play because they didn't wait on God. Now he's going to flip over to Rebecca, right? He's going to talk about Rebecca. And he's going to talk about the two children, uh, Isaac's children. So Isaac's now grown up. He's left, and he marries Rebecca. And, and they have twins. One of them's called Jacob, and the other one's called Esau. You guys know the story, right? So uh, Esau was the oldest twin, and Jacob, basically, it says Jacob was holding his heel on the way out, right? He was the second twin. So verse 10, not only that, but Rebecca's children were conceived at the same time by our father Isaac the promised child. Yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose in election might stand, not by works by him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated, for the purpose in election might stand. That sounds like God deemed it that was going to happen. Esau Esau was a goner before he was even born. Again, 
We covered this earlier in Romans 8. Foreknowledge and predestination. Because God knows everything from beginning to end. He already knows what Esau is going to do. He knows every action, every thought, everything that he will choose. That's why Esau is hated. That's why Esau is basically because of the election. He knows Esau is going to do this. It fits his purpose. He lets it go. He doesn't interfere with that purpose. He lets it happen because of who Esau is. Well, you created, you created him to be bad. No, he just created him to have his own free will. Esau made his own choices. I saw those choices. I know exactly what it's going to do. And so I don't like Esau, but I love Jacob. And Jacob, by the way, is, is known as a conniver, a deceiver. He's not a really upstanding kid at this point. We all, you know, he's not this, this holier-than-thou kind of kid. And, and we read that as we read the story. Uh, Gen uh, Genesis 25. It says, Later Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren, and the Lord heard his prayer, and his wife Rebecca conceived. Did you see the commonality between here and his dad and his mom? They were barren. God promised them a child and gave them Isaac. Isaac's now in the same bar uh, 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 barren condition. His wife isn't having a child, and he basically prays, and now God gives them a children as well, right? So he, it's repetitive. He goes on in verse 10, not only that, but Rebecca's children were conceived at the same time by our, our father Isaac. They were twins. Yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad in order, I read this already. Why am I reading it again? Oh, I see in Genesis 25. Okay, sorry. Genesis 25, <clears throat> here comes the uh, deception. All right, so Esau was a very burly man, man's man, right? He would go out and hunt and fish and do all the things men do. Jacob, not so much. Jacob was kind of like the guy that stayed home and watched HGTV and hung out with mom in the kitchen and just hung around mom. So Jacob, he was a mama's boy, basically. And uh, uh, Rebecca really loved Jacob. It's not that she didn't love Esau, but Esau was a very independent man. And Jacob's uh, father, really, Isaac, really liked Esau because he was a man's man. So what happens one day? Genesis 25. Once was Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. And he said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. Jacob replied, first, sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is my birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew, and he ate and he drank, and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. All right, birthright. When, when a child was born in the Jewish nation, and they were the first child, the birthright was like a document. It wasn't like, oh, you're the firstborn, like we do here. Like Josh is my firstborn. It was more than that. There was like, you know, ceremonial stuff that it gave him rights excuse me, when he was going to uh, take on and be the patriarch after the father would die. And so Esau came in, and Jacob was like, well, just give me your birthright, which would have made Jacob the next patriarch of the family. And Esau was like, yeah, whatever. Go ahead. Why? Because he made a decision in his flesh. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. I'll do anything to get some, yeah, whatever, just give me the food. And Jacob was like, ah, I got you, and basically cheated him out of his birthright. So this starts the conflict. So 14, then what then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Chronicles, 2 Chronicles 19 says, And now may the fear of the Lord be upon you. Be careful what you do. For the Lord our God is there, no, no injustice or partiality or bribery. Death, according to Exodus 33, is a response to breaking the law. We all break the law. We all deserve death, right? And so Chronicles says, And God is, shows no injustice or partiality or bribery, meaning if you deserve death, you're going to get death. 
But then Paul talks about him and says, God says to Moses, I'll have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So all of a sudden now, you begin to bring in God's presence. God can choose to have mercy on whoever he wants, even if you deserve death. Even if you broke the law, even if the law says death, I, God, have the ability to give you mercy. And that's what he did with us. That's what he did with us. We're not the chosen ones as pagans, as non-Jews. But he chose to have mercy on us. He chose that. It has nothing to do with you or me. Since everything has to do with God, why do we not believe God in all of his promises? Why do we not believe God in all of the things uh, that the world says, well, he cannot do? Of course he can. He's God, and he chose to have mercy on me, a sinner who deserves death. And so this is where Paul's taken at. Verse 16, it does not therefore depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. So he's communicating this to the Jewish nations, bring him around. He says, look, God gave you the rules. God gave you the law. The law leads to death. It has nothing to do, this salvation, with you. You've been working your life to be good your whole life, to follow every rule and law your whole life. And the reality is it's nothing to do with you. It has to do with me, God. I love you. I want to give you mercy. I can do that if I want to. And here's how I did it. I gave you my son. I gave you him as the perfect sacrifice. All you had to do was accept him. And that's what we as Christians or non-Christians, sorry, have to, have to do. That's all we have to do is just accept the message. Well, that sounds too easy. Well, it's not. It's not. For God, he chose to give you mercy. Just accept it. Well, I don't want, that, that doesn't sound right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. All I have to do is accept his mercy, and then I have his mercy. I equate that to the parable of the vineyard workers. We, we've, we've talked to this about, you know, in that, in that particular uh, parable before. But the idea, I'm not going to read it. You can find it in Matthew 20. But here's the idea. The vineyard owner, which is God, goes out very early in the morning at sunup, and he says, hey, I need workers for my vineyard. I'm going to pay you one denarius. And they come to work. And then he goes back in later in the morning and he sees another bunch of people and he says, hey, I, I need workers in my vineyard. I'll pay you one Daenerys. And they come work. And he does that every couple of hours every day until the very end, just before quitting time, he still goes back, finds more people, and he says, hey, I'm going to pay you, if you come work for me, one Daenerys. And at the end of the day, what he does is he goes and he starts paying the people and he pays the ones that came in last. And he gives them one Daenerys. And the people that started at like 5 a.m., very early in the morning, start grumbling. And they grumbled to the vineyard worker. They grumbled to God. Well, how is it possible that they got the same pay I got? Why are they, get more than, why are they getting the same thing I got? And the vineyard worker says, hey, it's my money. Don't I have the right to do with it as I wish? What did I tell you? I offered you one denarius for your work. I'm giving you one denarius. What's the problem? It's the same way with his mercy. I, I, I've been there. Well, yeah, that guy just came to Christ and he died a week later. How could he possibly have salvation? Because God has mercy. It's all about God. God's choice, not ours. There's nothing I could do. Being a good Christian all my life is something I should do because of the gift I've given. But it earns me nothing. It earns me nothing because God chose to give me mercy. Well, then I should be bad all my life. We, caught, we covered that before, right? God, Paul was saying, look, you know, if being bad gives God more glory, then we should be bad, you know, because that gives him more mercy. No, no. Be a matured individual. If you understand the message, you understand the calling, you understand how you're, you should live your life, then you should automatically live like a Christian, or what Paul was saying here, live like a Jew, right? Because God has mercy, and he chose to give it to you. doesn't negate anything. 
So I'm going to close here. God gave us the mercy. We did nothing to earn it. It said in Ephesians 2, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgression. It's by grace you have been saved. It's not by the work we do here now. It's not by the work you did when you thought you were going to be saved. It's by merely accepting the grace God gave you, the mercy, the promise, with nothing else tied to it. It's how you were saved. And that's, he's going to continue on in 9, and actually he'll keep going in 10, trying to convince the brethren, listen, God didn't lie. God had the right plan. Yes, the law was here for a purpose. The law was good, but it all points to Christ. Everything points to Christ, and that's the mercy of God. And all you have to do is believe it and accept it, and you get the blessing. And that's the message we need to give to the world right now because uh, those individuals are going to, at some point, the decisions they make will um, have a consequence in the, in, the, in the hereafter. Amen. Father, we thank you for the message that...